Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We are going to um, start this conversation with two amazing ladies here, uh, Naomi Klein and Araceli. Um, we are going to be discussing the relationship between uh, taking care of a world on fire. So it's essentially a conversation on climate. Um, and so today in 2020, we are discussing climate like no other years before this time. It has taken us at least 20 plus years to enter the, uh, the conversation on a mainstream level. There is so much interest on climate today and, um, and also throughout you know, the, the mainstream channels, right? So both from a community perspective, from an industry perspective, from a political perspective, climate has more and more become a topic of interest. Can you uh, both comment on this from, an, from, from a community level? Araceli? Of course, yeah. Um, again, my name is Araceli Jimenez. I'm, I'm an organizer with uh, Sunrise Movement, um, which is a youth-led uh, climate movement um, working to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. Um, and, you know, um, politics is everything. So I think it's no surprise that as this climate crisis and, you know, the crises that, that climate exacerbates, like, you know, income inequality, structural racism, um, you know, people, this is really a moment where people are, are waking up to these crises coming to a head um, and understanding that politics truly is everything and if, you know, we have a really crucial window um, to actually act collectively um, and not from an individualist perspective, to act collectively and, and make the, the systemic change that, that we know is necessary um, that, you know, really scientists have told us is, is necessary. It also, it's from an individual level but also on a global level. Can you comment on that, Naomi? Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's wonderful to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about the world on fire, but don't be afraid. <laughs> um, it's also about what we can do about it. And I think that that's a big part of the reason why we are seeing a shift. And we are seeing a very, very clear shift that's reflected in all the opinion polling. Um, a clear majority of Americans recognize that the crisis is real, that it is human caused. The issue of climate change denial is still you know, an issue among older male Republicans, but even their kids are, are moving, okay? Um, the biggest shift, though, is around a sense of urgency. Democrats have long said they care about the climate crisis, but if you ask them to rank all the other issues, climate change would come in like 19th or 20th. Um, for many, many years. And that sent a message to politicians that this wasn't an issue that they had to prioritize. In other words, they could campaign saying they were gonna do something, but if they didn't do anything really meaningful once they were in office, they wouldn't pay a political price like they would on other issues. Now, the polling out of the Democratic primaries is showing um, again and again that voters are ranking their, their sense of urgency around climate uh, on par with healthcare, often the second most urgent issue after healthcare. So that sends a very important message to politicians that they can't sacrifice this issue. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. One is just that a great many Americans are having their lives directly impacted by the crisis, right? So you know, here in New York, people still remember Superstorm Sandy. I could go on about all the freak weather, but on the West Coast, it's, it's about wildfires. So many people have been breathing in wildfire smoke. They see the images from Australia and so on. Um, I think, so, so it's that direct experience. It's the fact that scientists have been very clear that we are just flat out of time. You may, many of you have heard that we have 12 years to cut global emissions in half, and that, that's a stat that came from 2018, so that means we're now at 10 years. Um, but the other thing is the work that Araceli and her amazing group of young people have done, which is to put this vision of what we do about it, which is this positive vision about creating huge numbers of good, clean jobs, about addressing multiple crises, inequality, racism, gender exclusion, and lowering emissions at the same time. So it's a positive, hopeful vision of the future. And so it's that balance. The Sunrise Movement often talks about the balance between 
peril and promise. And I think that when we hold those two together, then, we, then we're not crouched into this sort of fetal position of fear. We actually feel we can kind of leap somewhere where we really want to go. So I think that's the game changer. Definitely. So from that point, we can explore the concept of climate positivity, climate positivity at scale. And as you said, the climate issue is a political issue. It's a human rights issue. It's a cultural issue. Culture uh, inspires policy. I mean, we have to have the, uh, the individual, the individual uh, action is as important as the industry action or the political action. From your point of view, uh, both of you, how can we mobilize the consumers? What can people do? Because I don't like to say consumers, because that sounds like we have one job is to consume, but we are concerned citizens. So from a perspective of the individual, what can we do on a global scale? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a huge question um, and so important in this time. I think that um, you know something that we can do is definitely vote, exercise your right to vote, um, and, and vote for, for people who actually have climate solutions that are at that global scale of the crisis, right? Um, and I think, but, but also, of course, like, um, like voting and getting involved in the political process isn't just about going to the ballot box one day or, or two days out of the year. Hopefully, we're all voting in, in the primaries coming up in New York. Um, but, you know, it's also about engaging every day with the people around you and not just your friends and your family and the people who you're comfortable talking to, but, you know, engaging with the person who serves you your coffee every day. You know, engaging with your Uber or Lyft driver, asking them, who are you voting for? Why are you voting? What are the issues you care about? Building that kind of solidarity at an interpersonal level with everyone you meet is so, so critical to raising the public consciousness and the urgency at the level that we need to actually tackle this crisis um, and to, to mobilize ourselves as, as, um, as a public to- As a to community. Vote, as a community, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I think that, that that sort of interpersonal work is all the more important because unfortunately, um, with all respect to the representatives of the media in the room, we aren't seeing the sense of urgency that people feel reflected in our media culture. And we're social animals. Humans are social animals. So we look to each other for social cues. You know, we may be horrified when we see these images of Australian fires and koalas and sending it to our friends. But if we watch a presidential debate like the last one and climate change doesn't even come up, we start thinking, wait a minute, Am I nuts? Like, what's going on? So it's important if our media isn't reflecting back the sense of urgency for us to continually talk to each other about it and not feel just like an individual alone having to solve a global crisis. Because the truth is, as individuals, we can make changes to our diet, to our consumption habits. Um, and that, I think, is important because it will show us that what they're saying on Fox News isn't true, that the world isn't going to end when we deal with climate change, because there's a lot of fear-mongering that says, oh, you know, they want to take away everything that is good, right? We actually are healthier when we do many of the things that are necessary to lower emissions, if we bike, um, if we walk, uh, if we eat less meat, and so on, we get healthier. But that is not going to lower emissions on the scale and at the speed that we need. It is going to take the collective action that is, yes, political, but it is also in every one of our sectors we need to get organized and figure out what a truly just, exciting transformation to the post-emission economy would look like, right? So that's a conversation that needs to happen in fashion, if you're in fashion and you've been doing amazing work on this. It's a conversation that needs to happen in tech, if you work in tech, and our organization is working with tech workers who want a Green New Deal. Um, it needs to happen in nursing, it needs to happen in, in, in teaching. It's a kind of a sort of a potluck process where everybody needs to bring their piece of this vision and so that everybody's invested and not afraid of the transformation that we need. Absolutely. Uh, we work closely with the United Nations and how many of you are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? The 17 se uh, Sustainable Development Goals that are uh, 
basically policy documents that are uh, that have been developed for the decade of action specifically and these 17 sustainable development goals are to be applied at every level from an industry level an individual level and as well as a political level from the political level we are seeing a lot of political action from the green new deal to the blue new deal and I recently found out that there is even a Red New Deal, which is the First Nation response to uh, the Green New Deal and the Blue New Deal. You've been part of activating the Green New Deal uh, and, and, and working with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And both of you are very well involved in, in these global action, this action that needs to be taken at scale. Can you comment on these uh, Green New Deal, Blue New Deal and guide us uh, through this uh, process? Well, it's a little bit like what I was just talking about, which is this, it's not uh, we need a blue new deal instead of a green new deal or a red deal instead of those. It's very much, all of this is happening in a spirit of yes and, right? Um, and so people are, are, are saying, wait a minute, you forgot like, I Hannah Johnson, a wonderful oceanographer who I think you had speaking um, at, at, at this gathering last year, pointed out that in a lot of the literature about the original New Deal, we forgot the ocean. <laughs> so she's, she worked with the Warren campaign on a blue New Deal, and we all need to adopt that. Same with the Red Deal, which is a group of indigenous scholars and activists who came together to talk about um, how do we marry and merge the need to respect indigenous knowledge and land rights um, with the need to um, rehabilitate the land, plants, you know, during the original New Deal, this country planted two billion trees. How do we do that in a way where we're planting native species and we're defending indigenous land rights? So it's that kind of grassroots from below vision that is happening to fill this out. And the more it comes from below, the more people are invested in it. So it's a very exciting process. Absolutely. So these are ground up solutions. They are not top down solutions that we are used to. Ground up solutions through community, through community building. Can you comment on, on that process from your perspective? Of course, yeah. I mean, going back to a couple of years ago when we you know, held a sit-in and really put the, the Green New Deal as like a, um, at, the, at the top of, of the, the, the agenda, at the top of the political conversation in this country, it was, that moment was born out of crisis, right? I mean, that, like we were sitting in and, and calling on um, the Democrats who had just taken back power in the House to actually make a plan to stop this crisis, like as California was on fire. And so, um, yeah, we dropped a 13-page resolution, and that resolution was heard around the country, and it's beautiful that so many people have seen themselves in that vision of a glorious future that's laid out in a Green New Deal, and have also come to the table not with um, only criticism, but with criticism and solutions, because that's the moment that we're in. That's the type of collaboration and solidarity that is absolutely necessary uh, if we're going to turn things around. Absolutely. And with the decade of action from the United Nations, what we hope to create is movement, collective movement, but not based out of fear, based out of hope, based out of love, based out of collaboration. And what is, oftentimes people ask me, what can we do? What can we do? And oftentimes I hear, you know, um, uh, pay it forward or yours, your, your, vote with your wallet and so on. But I would go beyond that because we can't really purchase our way to climate positivity. We can't buy our way out of this. We have to vote. We have to mobilize. We have to go out of a out of our comfort zone even, to be able to collaborate with one another. As we are looking at action on a voting scale or on a political scale, what are some of the advice that you can give the audience? Um, well, as Araceli mentioned, you have a primary coming up here in New York. <laughs> Um, and it, you know, I know it's a, a tough moment. I'm sure there are lots of people who supported Elizabeth Warren in this room, and um, you know, it's it, it's she ran an incredible campaign. Have we given her a round of applause yet? Um, she really did. And she had um, a bold Green New Deal as part of that platform, and a bold Blue New Deal as part of that platform. Um, 
the truth is now there's only one candidate who is who, who has a, a Green New Deal as part of their platform, who is being very clear that we can't say we are climate leaders and still say we can have more fracking, more fossil fuel expansion. We actually need to be honest about the science, and the science is telling us we actually have to get off fossil fuels. And anybody who's ever gone on a diet knows that you know you you can't have a salad and a Big Mac and say that it's working. You actually have to make the hard choice. Voices, and that's where we are with climate. And so there's, I think, I think honestly where we are so afraid in this moment, we're afraid of Trump, we're afraid of all the division, we're afraid of the coronavirus, which is making us afraid of each other. And we can't make decisions from a position of crouched fear and tell ourselves that the safe option is the one that isn't proposing change on the scale of the crises we need. We are in a crisis moment, and we know from our past that those moments require us to em embrace a fighting spirit, right? Um, this is not a moment where we try to make peace with polluters. This is a moment where we really have to find our fight. And we have to question what safe is. Um, safe is not... Um, policies that are not going to keep us safe, okay? Um, and, and, you know, safe, I think, are the kinds of solutions that are really on the scale of the crisis. And I, don't, I know that it's not easy. Um, I know that a lot of us don't have our ideal scenario on that ballot. Um, but I really feel like young people are telling us something really powerful right now. Um, and... A lot of us have forwarded speeches by Greta Thunberg or that she made at the United Nations and UN climate summits where she's challenging um, you know, people of my generation and older um, to really prioritize young people's futures and make some hard decisions. And I would just say, if you ever forwarded a Greta Thunberg speech and said, this young woman is amazing, play it again and listen before you vote. And before Greta Thunberg, there were so many black, brown, indigenous activists that were part of this global movement, right? I mean, she, she got into the mass media, but we know she's standing on the shoulders of many, many young folks from black, brown, indigenous movements that were uh, asking the, the crowds before them to... Uh, look at it from a sense of hope, from a sense of action. And that is also what you guys were helping to do in the Sunrise Movement. Can you, can you tell us about, from your perspective, what can you advise the audience to, to do in terms of taking action on a global scale through voting? Of course, yeah. And uh, like always wanting to, wanting to center indigenous wisdom in the room and calling back to the, the Red New Deal that you mentioned earlier, a core tenet of that is that we have to understand that the tools and the methods that got us into this crisis are not going to get us out of this crisis. And so I'm, I totally agree, agree with Naomi. Like I know that New York primary is coming up and we all have uh, tough decisions to be making, tough uh, moments to be reckoning with. And I just want to sort of like look at the most recent like political history in this country, let's say just like the last 20 years. Let's be honest with ourselves. In the last 20 years, only one Democrat has been elected to the highest office in this country is Barack Obama and the way he won was by Building a mass movement that united people across the lines of generation across the lines of gender across the lines of race and religion and ethnicity of sexual orientation and so when when we look at at the field now and, and Naomi said this per perfectly we can't we have to redefine what is safe we have to look at who is building that same coalition right now and you know, look at that history, deeply, deeply reckon with, with what it will actually take to win and, and beat Trump and make sure that November 3rd is a referendum on, on fascism and, and climate denial. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to reiterate that Absolutely. point just because it's so, so critical. And just to put it really, really bluntly, if you think you know what a Bernie bro look like, looks like, it looks like this. <laughs> 
And again, just to take it down to earth, when you plant a seed and you water it, you water it with fear or do you water it with love? Like, just raise your hands if you water something with fear. Do you water it with love? And you can see it's even proven scientifically that when you talk to your plants and you water them with love, they grow healthy, they grow strong. And when we talk about climate, this is exactly the kind of steps we want to be taking. Not steps taken out of fear, out of, uh, you know, fear of one another or fear of whatever is going to happen, but steps, bold steps taken out of hope, taken out of love. Last note, both of you, a last note on um, this idea of the world is on fire, but it's not the end of the world. My last note would be we have to find our fire. Fire is a life-giving force. There would be no life on this planet without the life-giving fire of the sun. And I love that the Sunrise Movement named themselves after that fire. Indigenous people have used fire for millennia to clear away the debris and make room for new growth, to fertilize the soil. So we need to find that, that fire and we need to clear away whatever debris is inside of us that is keeping us from living up to our historical moment with courage. We all have debris inside of us that is holding us back. I don't know what your debris is. I've tried to find mine and I've tried to burn it away so I can live up to my moment in history because my, the stakes are high. They're so high. Hmm. Last, last comments, <laughs> it's tough to choose. Um, I think the most important thing, the thing that I, I will tell anyone who will listen to me, even for a second, is that this moment calls for a, a level of hope that is unprecedented. And when I say hope, I don't just mean like a casual thought in the back of your mind that maybe one day things will get better. By hope, I mean the radical form of labor that is wading through the darkness of this moment and the crises of this time to refine it into something beautiful and free that you can share with everyone around you. And I think that that is perfectly embodied in, in the spirit of, of the Green New Deal, in, in the Blue New Deal, in the Red New Deal. And it's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, spark that I think helps people find their fire. It's what's helped me find my fire. Because I know I, couldn't, I wouldn't never be able to do this work day, <laughs> day in and day out if I wasn't able to refine the darkness of this time into the hope that, that drives me and I think will, will drive this country to that glorious vision of the future where everyone can live a life with dignity and respect, with a good job that pays them a decent wage, gives them health care, makes sure that all of their basic human rights are met. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> So now, maybe what's most uh, appropriate to do is to take a deep breath, deep breath in your belly, deep breath, and a breath that is filled with love, filled with courage, filled with hope, because that is what we need you all to do. Today, I mean, this year, 2020, starts the decade of action. We have 10 years where we can turn it all around. We can work together, and we can create this kind of unity that we are looking for. Um, when we are exploring co topics around climate, and oftentimes it drives everyone to fear. Even the industry, when we talk about climate within any industry, everyone's like, oh, but we're not sustainable. We don't want to show what's around. We want to challenge that. In fact, we must go through fear in order for us to find these global positive solutions because otherwise, if we stay stuck in our fear, we are going to miss the boat. And it's no time to miss the boat right now. We have to take those giant steps. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.